highlight every thought, I introduce myself in a minute. You find my name over there. I'm just introducing this course. Okay, I'm introducing, trying to introduce actually. It's very difficult to introduce a CPSP course because it's extremely rich, by the way. And you're going to encounter and to hear different lectures by different uh, professors who teach CPSP. Now, CPSP is a program, uh, it's a requirement. Okay, if you look at the first part, uh, at the first page of your handouts, you will notice. Uh, that I'm reminding you of the CDSP requirements, okay? Uh, and how to choose your two required courses. Two CDSP courses, I think for most of you, check with your advisors and please check with the CS department in nicely building, okay? Now, CS is a program about great books. Please stop me if, uh, if I'm going fast or if you have any questions. Don't hesitate, okay? Uh, you're paying us here. <laughs> we're here to sell you as teachers uh, and as programs as well. So don't hesitate. Just to stop us, ask any questions, and we'll always try to open a dialogue. You might have been introduced to some of these readings, perhaps in your university, in your schools earlier, whether coming from French system or English system. Uh, but now we're going to have all these readings now in a different light, and I'm going to explain how. So CS is a program about great books. These are books central to the education of any cultivated person. These are books by authors that shaped the thinking of millions of people throughout the ages and centuries, and opened the way for a message of tolerance, and I underline this, okay? We're going to see afterwards why do we call them great books, okay? So this program is a program of great books. you find it in any American university uh, 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 since the 1920s at least, okay? In USA and other American universities all around the world, okay? So it is a basic part for your culture, for your cultural growth, okay? Uh, great books, you might call them, we call it Civilization Sequence, Civilization Studies, what have you, different things. So these books have influenced great minds and shaped cultural heritages, either universally or in a specific cultural milieu. In a sense, these books form a vital part of the public consciousness of many societies till our present day. Accordingly, they also speak to our reality and our existence. Reality is this is that a reality, a question that we we'll face in the university, philosophical and in other part is that a reality. Now when I say reality here, I mean what we are now, what where do we stand now as a humanity and in different societies, in different social combinations and constellations, okay? These books pose, still pose questions to us in the 21st century. Now, what do we do in CS courses? Basically, we read. We are university students, we should be trained to read. And we need this training, by the way. Now, CSP is, the courses are not enough for our uh, training in reading. Uh, reading is an art. Okay, but we try to do basically two, three things, and basic things, huh? And part of what we're doing, okay, great minds, great books, what have you, but part of it is practical. How to read? To have this ability, okay, to read, function to read, how to understand, and how to open dialogue in class about basic, basic problems of civilizations, okay, of humanities and civilizations. So our role is that of a midwife. Underline the word if you have it on your handouts or write it down. We're going to see this word when we, this term, when we encounter uh, 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 Plato and his teacher, okay, Socrates. He is a midwife. A midwife is someone who helps in birth. Qabila qanuniya, we call it in Arabic. Today we do everything in the hospital. So someone who will help us out our minds, express 
our minds and our ideas in a structured way. So, how to read, by the way? First, let us keep in mind that our readings are of limited range, something of 30 pages every week, which is not much, by the way. Uh, this training we needed very much, especially if you want to continue your studies abroad or in a UB in graduate studies. Okay? We should be able to read 30 to 100 pages and one book and two books sometimes. And I remember when I started my graduate studies abroad, and you will see, and it's not one of my experience, anyone who starts graduate studies abroad, you will find that, well, and I, I don't have, I miss this training. They throw the book in front of you. Today you don't throw it, you send a PDF, or you tell the students enter the website, download, and you are responsible. A book, 100 pages, 200 pages sometimes, okay, three, four articles per week. No, all what we're doing here are 30 pages, which is not much, by the way. Now, to start off with the reading of these 30 pages. In order to enjoy the great text we are reading, and to make of our reading experience a productive and interactive activity, I suggest, this is my experience, we have first a look at the text before coming to the Monday lectures. Now, I say a text. Uh, when I teach CVSP, and I teach all with time, last semester I taught CVSP, we didn't have text. I put everything online, okay, so students were downloading online. We're not anymore buying books or going to the library to find the books. But we have books, we have text, so we call them text, okay? Now, the first thing is look at the reading, download it, buy it, uh, borrow it, uh, whatever you want, but please have it in class with you. Yani either online have it with you in class or have the text with you. And without a text in class, we can't do anything together, okay? So the first thing, have a look at the text. I suggest during the weekend before going, ah, weekend, yes, please, just have a look one hour, okay, three quarters of an hour, have a quick look, what we say, you know, a quick look, to, just to, to have a taste, an idea of the text. Now, the lectures afterwards, you, you come to this Monday lecture, okay? Uh, each and every mo Monday lecture is given by a different professor, I suppose. Uh, now, the lectures are meant to introduce the text. If you were encountered, if you have seen the text on Sunday, yani during the week and before coming to class, just to have a look, to have a taste. Now, the lecture will introduce, perhaps I shift to this one. It's fine, I think. Yes, if you have a look at the lecture, uh, before, uh, ahead of time, the, the Monday lecture will introduce the text, will help you situate the text, okay? Pose some b basic questions. Uh, you're hearing me, isn't, aren't you? My net is working. Uh, so we'll try to pose some questions, we'll try to situate the text, yeah, and put the text in its context, okay? Uh, historical, social, literary context pose some questions, and you should be able to concentrate during these usually 40, 35 to 40, 45 minutes, the Monday lectures. It's part, again, of your training to concentrate during this. How do we concentrate? Just follow the handout, stop the lecturers if you have some questions, and a basic thing, when you go back to class, when you meet the first sessions in class to read, what we call them the one-to-one yani -one, uh, uh, lectures, Ask the professor, ask the instructor if you have any questions about the lectures, if things were unclear in the lecture. Now, we're not telling you truths. Yani khalas, and this is the final truth. This is debatable. Now, we meet as professors, as lecturers, yani, we meet after the lecture, we meet at least three, four times per month to discuss the readings and to discuss the lectures. And we have different approaches. Someone comes from archaeology, another one comes from psychology, a third professor comes from literature, a fourth comes from philosophy. So we approach the same text from different angles. There are no final truths in CVSP. The text is there for us to read and interpret. And we might have, in, in one class, when we open discussion, we might have different various opinions. So don't talk about truths, okay? Please, keep it in mind, OK? 
okay? And keep in mind that we as professors who teach these courses, CVSP courses, from CS201 through CS206 uh, and the other courses, 207, 208, 230, 290, what have you, we don't, there's no department that's called CVSP. We come from different walks from other departments. History, archaeology, political science, philosophy, uh, sometimes biology, uh, what have you, all, dif all different uh, possible departments. Now let me move, I'm not moving with the slides. Let's have a look. So text that we have, a permanent significance for generation of readers, I've mentioned this. What is a classic? This is to answer the question, what is a classic? They speak to our reality and open for us questions relative to our being. We've done this. These are texts, certain texts have passed test of time. What do we read in CVSP? Let's answer the questions. Books that do something for us, okay, in our cultural life. Now we move, that we do, do in this course. In this semester, we are reading CVSP 201. Uh, it introduces to us cultures, human culture, civilizations and cultures. So we start with Mesopotamia. This is the Greek word for the land between the two rivers. Which stretches today from the Arabic, Arabian Persian Gulf up to Armenia. Okay, the land between Tigris and Euphrates. So this, this, the earliest cultures that we have, we have the archeologists, we have historians uh, uh, among us. The earliest cultures started there. By the way, the earliest written, written down, yani, okay, form, the earliest epic that we have started there. So we start with the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, give me some time so that I organize my mind. And before I start there, and I'm saying, what we offer is an exercise in how to read, we said this, how to discuss and express our minds orally and in writing. So these are the basic tools that we try to put in your hands. Of course we read. We want to know the reading. We want to know something about the cultures that we are reading about. But we do basic skills. Basic skills, this is part of CVSP. This is part of any course you attend at the university. There are basic skills of reading, writing, discussing, uh, uh, and definitely uh, yeah, discussing the content. We learn vocabulary, by the way. One of the skills we do in CVSP, that you learn vocabulary from the realm of cultural vocabulary. Effectively, we, uh, we also undertake with these books a journey, capital journey, rehla. The word journey has become, in world literature and in philosophy even, okay, in the different books of sciences, when we say a journey, it is a journey of life, yes, indeed, it is a journey of life. It is a journey of these people, of these cultures. But at the same time, we are reading about cultural journeys and we are doing our own journey. Each and every course you do is a journey. And then the whole, the sum of the courses during three or four years at the university, then this is a journey. So it's a journey within a journey, yes, indeed. Okay? So we're doing a journey in this course. That makes us share in the general richness of human cultures. Now, I'll quote from uh, Professor Nussbaum, uh, quotation, the ability to imagine the experience of another, another person, the other, if you want, another culture, a capacity almost all human beings possess in some form, this needs to be greatly enhanced and refined if we are to have any hope of sustaining decent institutions across the many divisions that any modern society contains. So the ability to imagine other cultures, to imagine other people, to imagine the other whom sometimes you term as an enemy. What is his, her culture? How does he, she thinks? How does these cultures before us, this civilization, okay, went on a journey till we reach here where we stand today in the 21st century? So we will be dealing with different genres. You know the word genre? 
write it down, underline asnaf adabiya, anwa, with different genres or types of texts from various epochs and cultures from the ancient and classical world from Mesopotamia, the land between the two rivers, to classical Greek and Roman culture. So we start with the text from Mesopotamia, then we move to Greece, ancient Greece. We're going to see different genres there, and then we close up with the Roman culture, only one text from the Roman culture, which touches upon various aspects from the Roman culture. Uh, the first text we will encounter is the epic poem of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest known poems and a document of genuinely ancient humanism. In Mesopotamia, we know Mesopotamia now, the land between the two rivers, mainly Iraq and northern Syria today, from the third millennium before a common era. Common era is the dates that we calendar that we are using now. So third millennium before a common era, and this is something between 5,000 to 6,000 years ago. I'm saying one of the earliest texts, if not the earliest text, written text that we have. Now, have a look at one of the tables of the text. This is what we call the kunai form, okay? The kunai uh, is, this is, uh, we, they use this instrument, okay, in order to carve, and this is not stone, by the way, this is clay, to, uh, to carve on clay these different symbols. This is one of the first alphabet, alphabet, if we can call this an alphabet. We call it the kunai form, okay? So they found this epic, I'm not entering now into details, it's not anyway my uh, specialty. Read the first 30 pages of the epic. The epic is only something like 60 pages, uh, small A5. Okay, the introduction is very interesting, read the introduction, and we're going to be introduced to this in another lecture, okay? So this is, we received tablets like this, who tell us the story, the tablets tell us the story of Gilgamesh, the epic that we are reading as a first text. Now, what is an epic, by the way? Can you help me? What's an epic? Hello? No, I, a story, fine, excellent. So it is, in a way, a story, definitely. Other ideas? It's a journey. So it's a story about the journey. By the way, when I'm saying a story, indeed, it's a story, but it is a poem, okay? So it is a po it's not a text like a story. Like it is usually a poem, let's say. It is a sublime narrative, a narrative poem, we call it, okay? So a story, definitely, which went through a long period of oral tradition before it was written down in poetry. Yeah, and when I say we found these clay uh, tablets, kunai form, something like 300, 5,000 years uh, before our common era, but this means at least for generations before that time, this narrative has been going on as oral tradition, okay? Transmitted orally before someone comes and writes it down, okay? So it's oral written tradition. It narrates the deeds and adventures of a heroic or legendary figures and reflects heroic ethos. Okay, now figures, are these figures real figures? I don't know, definitely not, okay? They represent perhaps some human beings that lived at some point, okay? Whose narratives was told, were told, Early. And then you add to it, okay, from the story of this man, from the story of that. Uh, they culminate in a narrative poem, and they have a name. Gilgamesh is the hero now, okay? Was there ever a Gilgamesh? I don't know, okay? Why should there ever be a Gilgamesh? Was there ever any one of the great names that we know of in ancient history, okay? Perhaps yes, perhaps no, okay? But we look at these heroic figures as representations of the cultures. <laughs> so 
So an epic sublime poem, I think we have this on your handouts as well, so I'm not going to stop and read it. So epics are mythical in the sense that myth is a traditional and legendary story usually concerning some being or hero or event with or without the determinable basis of fact or natural explanation, especially one that is concerned with diet is, diet is, you know, the, the gods, gods with small g. All gods are the small g. Uh, diet is yani, things that we believe in, higher beings that we believe in, or that certain culture believes in. Epics are mythical, traditional, legendary, and these epics that we are dealing with in this course, CVSP 201, uh, belong to our expressions of what we call polytheism. Poly is many. And theism comes from the Theo in Greek. I don't know Greek, by the way, okay? I just don't know Greek, but I'm helping you to know the etymology of the word. Theo is the god or gods or the deity in Greek. Theism, so poly, polytheism is belief in different poly, many gods, okay? So these are polytheistic cultures. Uh, yeah, I have reached point uh, five on your fly sheets. So the three cultures that we will be introduced that you will be introduced to are polytheistic. Polytheism is the belief in many gods, a hierarchical pantheon of gods, each representing a cosmic phenomenon. One god for the thunder, one god for the seas and oceans, one god for the underground, another god for, the, for fire or for water or what have you, okay? Each one has a definite sphere of influence, with the higher God residing as a supreme figure, sometimes يعني, uh, first among others, okay? So another God. Polytheistic cultures also include belief in many demonic and ghostly forces and some malevolent supernatural beings. So not only the gods, we have different spirits and demons. The gods interfere in human affairs and intermarry with the human beings. Any balanced worshiper now does not pick and choose between the various gods, between the various powers, but pays respect to all these powers, to all these gods. Now, let us see. So we are talking about an epic. An epic is a narrative poem singing the deeds of great human beings who are beyond humanity. An epic is a narrative form which has been transmitted orally and then written down through centuries, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of years before it was written down. They represent a certain culture, a certain approach to life, a certain vision of the role of human being, and they represent they are born within polytheistic cultures. Now, who is a hero or what is a hero? Uh, it's very important to know now that uh, heroes, hero is a godlike person with many characteristics. He's handsome, usually it's a he, okay? We have many goddesses, by the way. And goddesses fall in love with the heroes sometimes because they are strong and handsome and pretty and what have you, okay? So heroes are godlike persons with many characteristics, handsome appearance and strengths. Heroes are subjected to the harshness of their fate and shaped by the obstacles of their journeys. Again, we, ha again, we have the, the idea of the journey, the hero undertakes a journey. In a journey we have obstacles, you know what are obstacles, things that we face uh, uh, hindrances that we face on the road, uh, harshness of their fate. We're going to come to the idea of fate in the different cultures. It's not only one idea. Each culture has a different approach to fate. Fate is where do I, as a human being, man and woman, stand within this vast 
universe of the gods. Okay? Why do I die? All these questions that we still pose today and that religion help us to understand. By the way, epics represent the religious understanding of these nations and being. Now here we have Gilgamesh, this legendary figure as he appears in one of the tablets. And there we have from the Greek cultures, this is Odysseus in the Odyssey, okay? As we see the hero, hero Gilgamesh and Odysseus. So these are our heroes in the first two texts that we are going to read. Often, heroes begin with their voyages full of recklessness. Recklessness, in Arabic, is عدم اكتراث full of themselves I can do everything okay I will conquer uh, the moon and I will conquer everything everyone would love me so we will start with a ego very big ego okay recklessness <coughs> they start there full of recklessness and selfishness as we are going to see yet at the end they acquire wisdom justice, and a story of their own, their own epic, their own narrative, okay? In a sense, those who have written down the story, who has transmitted the story orally and written it down centuries or thousands of years in certain cultures, are at the end of the day telling us about the aims and aspirations and what is of their own culture, all this now personified and the ideal of a hero. A hero excels in skill and courage, faces difficulties and obstacles created to him by the gods, so the gods interfere in the face of the hero, in the face of any human being who is trying to achieve his humanness. The gods get envious, okay? They interfere, or sometimes the hero, as we said, as I've said earlier, start his recklessness, so the gods try to put, you know, the. The, the, the line for him. So uh, he accepts challenges, stands up to them, fights against monsters and demons, make unnecessary risks, and discovers frightful and unknown lands and mysteries. In all this, the hero represents the culture, represents the people of the culture. Now, each and every hero undergoes a rite of passage. Since we are saying journey, any journey is a rite of passage, in a sense, okay. And when I'm saying that we are now undergoing a journey at the university, university level of three years, these are what we call uh, 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 yeah, the, the rite of passage. And I'm going to use only some words. This is from Wikipedia in order to simplify things for you, okay? But the theory is a theory in anthropology, in cultural uh, uh, studies, and in sociology by a scholar called Van Gennep at the beginning of the century, and then it was developed further by modern uh, sociologist, okay, the theory of liminality and what we are going to uh, say today too. The rite of passage is initiation, right? You know what's initiation? Okay? Uh, in the army we have what we call initiation right as well. When you finish the first first year of training at the army, Lebanese army, and any other army, you go through what we call fire initiation. Okay, uh, so it's a kind of in any church, in any sect, Muslim, Christian, uh, Jewish, what have you, okay, there is a rite of passage as well. Anyone who enters this religion or this sect or who comes now of age in order to be a human being who thinks now and is responsible for what he, she is doing and is entering a certain sect or a certain group or a certain religion, then after the first weeks of training, months of training, you go through a rite of passage. Bil Kashef in Scouts, we call it totem, uh, totem, uh, and you get a name. Before that, you don't have a name. You're nobody. Okay? First, you need to get to be aware of what you're doing, be responsible for what you are doing. So it is a ritual that marks a change in a person's social and sexual. And when you come of age, 
young girls and young men okay there's there used to be ما بعرف anymore there used to be a collective ceremony for that Rites of passage are often ceremonies surrounding events such as childbirth or other milestones within puberty and coming of age. Rites of passage have three phases, separation, liminality. Liminality is what we call the, is a bit called barzakh in Arabic, this is a no man's land. You've left your society or you are leaving a certain Uh, age, uh, certain circumstances, you enter into an unknown and then you come out a member in a new society. I'm not going to stop more at this, I need the time. Uh, marking entrance or acceptance into a group or society, it could also be formal admission to adulthood in community or one of its formal components, ta 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 ila akhirihi. Now you're spending three years at the university, by the way, in this ismos in this liminal stage. You are being trained in different courses, different things. You think I'm going to end up, I'm going to study biology or psychology or engineering or medicine or literature or what have you, okay? And then you'll change your mind. You'll attend a course here, a course there, then you'll change your mind about some things, okay? You will have difficulties, you will have problems. After these three years of liminal stage, why liminal? All the time changing, I'm insecure sometimes. Till I get out of three years fighting the obstacles, okay, I get my BA, BE, BS, what have you, and then we celebrate. This celebration ends the liminal stage that we were in, and this gives us the license to enter into the society, okay? So we want to understand the journey of a hero, what we're reading in the text, as Erit du passage, rite of passage. Now we move from Gilgamesh. By the way, Gilgamesh is a fascinating short narrative, poetic narrative, with specific questions about death, about life, about friendship, about the meaning of life, about the meaning of human relationships, by the way, okay? Uh, These texts are still not only read in schools and in universities. These texts are played on stage and in films and different uh, artistic performances all around the world because the questions that they pose still, as I said earlier, touch on uh, humanity today. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to finish everything, but just give you a taste of what we're doing. Now we move from Mesopotamia to ancient Greece. This is the Mediterranean Sea. And now this is different culture, by the way. And I told you at the beginning, we're reading different cultures, texts from different cultures, from different epochs as well, and from different genres. Now we move to Greece. And In Greece, we're going to read one of the oldest epics. Again, an epic, we know what's an epic now, but don't ask me who has written the epic. And now what we're going to read, this is now an epic by Homer. Was that a Homer, really? And we find this, perhaps yes. Most probably, perhaps yes. Most probably no, I don't know, okay? Or did Homer, what, did, what Homer did was to take an oral tradition which was written before him for thousands of years, for hundreds of years, orally, oral tradition, and he put it down into artistic, poetic form. Again, it's an epic that represents now the Greek culture at a certain time when I say Greek culture, okay? This is around 1,200 BC. Now the epic was found or was written, supposedly written down around 800 BC by Homer, a blind singer of tales. We're going to encounter this blind singer of tales again, okay? Named Homer with a capital H, okay? So now we're moving to this culture and it tells us about a journey again. Now this is the Aegean and uh, the Mediterranean uh, Greek culture. Uh, let me try to spot Ithaca. Ithaca should be somewhere here, isn't it? I think, supposedly Ithaca should be some point here. So anyway, uh, why Ithaca? We're going to see why Ithaca in a minute. So now we are talking about 
it's still early to talk about polis. The idea of polis, the Greeks were living in city states. Okay? It's great culture, but these people are living, you know, different islands, different places, living in city states. I'm coming to the idea of a city state in a minute. So, what we are reading is the Odyssey now. Uh, again, one of the greatest books. We're talking about great books. First, Gilgamesh now, the Odyssey. Greek culture, 800 BC, and singing the tale, the, the glory of this Greek culture, of this Greek society. Now we're going to spend, in CVS P201, we're going to read at least four different texts from the Greek culture. The first one is the Odyssey, going back 800, written down supposedly 800 BC. Okay, but then we are going to move to another genre. Let me move to this other genre that we are going to do. We move now from uh, an epic to the historical form. Okay, historical writing. Now we're around, we're in the fifth century, between the fifth and the fourth century, and we are talking about Thukikidus. Here we come to Thukikides. first. Let me first tell you about the idea of the polis. Polis is a community of adult male citizens, and women and children, as well as slaves, were non-citizens. They didn't have a vote. A vote, yes, they had kind of representation, a parliament. These are the first democracies, by the way. The idea of democracy is a Greek word anyway, and comes from the Greek polis. So, but we can't talk about the Greek polis proper as I'm introducing it now, and as we will read it in Aristotle, and Plato, and Sophocles, and Thucydides, okay, except around in the fifth century. Now, this is a city-state. The polis exists for the sake of good life, for the sake of the individual, community and individual. The individual has a role in this society. So it is a society to build our good life. It is an agreement between adult men, adult citizens, men, okay, in order to live a good life. Anyone who is living, not living in a polis, is not, lacks something in his humanity. By the way, in Greek culture, being in exile away the polis is the most brutal thing we can do to a human being, okay? So the polis exists for the sake of good life, direct participation in the making of rational choices after discussion. Now, what is rational? We today question all the, uh, the whole idea of rationality, if you want, okay? But it's not in this philosophical sense. Yani, Mature men, usually, okay, these are small communities, but the, the largest polis, Athens, at its largest, was something about 300,000 citizens with women and children and slaves. And please correct me, because I'm not the, I'm not the expert in this, but what I've read about, okay. Maneta, when we are talking about men, Maneta, those who are voting and meeting and taking decisions, rational decisions, are around 100,000 men, perhaps, 100,000, 20 men, okay. So the idea of polis is the idea of a human being fulfills his humanity and excellence as an active member of the polis. Now we move from the epics to a different genre. Now it is a historical genre. I'm not anymore reading, so I'm not sure that I am. Uh, are you following me? Is this too much for you? Am I jumping over your heads? Okay. It's only introductory, by the way. And I don't think that this is, I'm just giving a taste of what we do in CVSP. We're going to hear lectures about this and you are going to read in class. Uh, now we move to a uh, uh, historical genre, uh, a book about the Peloponnesian Wars. Peloponnesian Wars, if I go back to uh, this is Peloponnesian, okay? So named by the area, these are the Peloponnesian Wars. The Peloponnesian Wars were between Sparta and Athens. Okay, between Sparta and Athens, and we'll say why in a minute. 
It was written by Thukydides, 450 to 395 BC, BCE, and before our common era. In his book, he describes the Peloponnesian Wars from that lasted something like 28 years, from 431 to 404 before our common era. Peloponnese refers to a geographic area in southern Greece, I've showed you where. This war was seen as the greatest war in ancient Greek history and was fought between Athens and the Peloponnesian League led by Sparta. So we have the Athenian League, by the way, and then we have the uh, uh, Spartan League. History, according to Thukydides, are we going to see, means inquiry. And Thukydides, who fought the war during the first years, studies causes and effects of the war using his reason and intelligence. So someone who stands before the question, why the war? All of us have stood before this question. We, the generation before you, the Lebanese Civil War, why a war that lasts 15 years? Now, why a war in Syria the last five years? Regardless of who's fighting who, who uh, is on the right or on the wrong, if there's right and wrong uh, anywhere, okay? Why the war and what am I doing as a human being, a young man at the beginning of my coming out to the world and then there is a war? So why the war? So Kikidis was trying to answer the question why the war? As a historian, he fought the war, the first year during the war. So he started by telling us the causes to study. The first time we have someone studying the war as a, yani trying to, to, we say, as a medical doctor to put his finger, to try to name what are the causes and why. We read speeches there, we read about great men in Greek and uh, in Greek culture, and we read about what Thukikides calls human nature. Now, this is a big thing, human nature. Is there a human nature? Yes, how to understand it? Different school understands it in different ways. But Smafi, she has faith, which is called human nature, okay? Human nature is formed by social and psychological and economic factors as well. Now, Thukikides tells us if, as if there were, as if there is a human nature inherent in the human being, which is aggressiveness. We're going to discuss this in classes. So, and then we have the contrast between right and wrong. Who is right and who's wrong? If I have the upper hand, if I have the power, does this mean that I am in the right? No. Okay? Can the weaker part, if this part, if this party has its own arguments and its own rights, stand in front in the face of might? So we're going to read the million debates and other debates. We're not reading the whole book, by the way. We are reading parts of these books. His description of the plague that struck Athens after the first year of the war is a vigor and compassionate presentation showing the hopelessness of the human being. During the first, after the first year of the war, a plague, thousand plague, and ta'un. Okay, marad, hey. Struck the, thousands of feeling where people were, 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 were being, uh, were dying like flies. No one could help anyone. And then again, he talks of the human nature. Some people forgot about death, forgot about gods, forgot about the, the love to their neighbor, the love to the second, to the next, and then they try what you call snatch the life. Steal, have fun, do sex, drink, sleep, no, I'm dying tomorrow, okay? So what we read in Thukikides are still questions permanent, pertinent permanently pertinent to our lives as human beings. Now, so we, are, we were introduced to the epic, to the genre of the epic, to the genre of now uh, historical reading, and then we move to the drama. Do you have any questions? It's fine. Yalla, we still have 10 minutes, and I'll try 
يعني to do with you as uh, as much as I can. We move to drama, uh, and we are going to read Sophocles. Sophocles is one of the greatest dramatists. يعني those who write plays, who write theater. It's the first time we can talk about theater is when is during this time. And Sophocles is one of the greatest uh, uh, playwrights at that time. So Sophocles, we're talking about 496 to 406 BC. As I've said, this is the time of the polis, fifth century, fourth century in Greece. From the region of Athens, he's one of the three famous Greek tragedians, we call them. Tragedy and tragedians. Tragedy is a different genre than that of the epic. Homeric epics represents the long gone heroic age. So the epic is talking about, we said, the ancient days of a civilization. The gods play an important role in heroic legends with the divine intervention. The tragedy, in contrast, is the genre of the polis. Yani, I can't talk of, as I said, a tragedy of the theater except of in the Greek polis. So it is, is a bit called fan madini, yani, uh, it's of, of, of the city, of the palace. Dramas used to be performed in a yearly festival in Athens for the whole people during the great Dionysia in spring. So there was a festival in spring, Dionysian, uh, according to God, Dionysian, who is, is a bit called the, uh, the protecting God of this feast. First at the Agora, at the marketplace, or assemb for assembly, and later in the amphitheater. This is an amphitheater. Now, uh, you're going to hear about amphitheaters. Later, you found amphitheaters in Lebanon as well. Uh, the greatest amphitheater in our environment is in Syria, in Busra, يعني on the uh, uh, Jordanian-Syrian grenze. Uh, 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 near Zara'a, Hauran, okay, we have beautiful amphitheater there. Amphitheater is the place where the citizens, these male citizens, first used to uh, meet, to discuss, uh, to discuss, uh, as we said, and vote and take their rational decisions about the police. And uh, the festival. Now, this form of theater, the acoustic is excellent. Anyone who stands here in the middle, Yani, the actors or anyone, and you speak, it's like a microphone, by the way. This could take something from, according to the size of the amphitheater. Sometimes if it's a small amphitheater, 500, 600 people, up to 15,000 people, and the acoustics are excellent. Ma fi microphones, medically, I'm not But akid ma fi tashwish saut, yani, as today. So anyone standing there would hear everything. And then this form, the semicircular form, from up to down, you have an excellent view, and at the center, so this is the center, is the center of the community. This is, is a bit called what we call enable, surra, of the universe as well as of the police. So this is, this symbolizes, okay, the police with its citizen, and it symbolizes the cosmic view. The this is the theater where the festivals used to take place, and the tragedies okay, used to be played during this week in the amphitheater. Tragedy unfolds slow in action. As we're going to see, tragedy is tragic action and human contentment and goodness. يعني it is a tragic action. We say today, oh, tragedy. We say tragedy. In different sense. Tragedy is the lot of the human being, okay? Like the hero. We had the hero and the epic, now everything is concentrated in one, one human being, okay, uh, who is facing obstacles, real internal and external obstacles, on the cosmic level, on the political level, and on the individual level. A human being, an individual who is trying to make a decision, and everything is standing in his face. But he's great, someone who wants the excellence of himself and of the palace at the political level. So we have on the theater, in front of us, there, in the middle, in the center, this human being who is, we see, we follow, 
his tragic unfolding of his character. So tragedy unfolds through, uh, again, I read from here, tragic hero in misfortune at, at grips with destiny. The Greek word is moira. Don't understand it as qada or qadar or fate as we understand it in Christianity and Islam or Judaism. This is a different culture, okay? A good person could fall short of full goodness under circumstances not under his control. But the main thing is that this individual goes on performing his life, trying to be excellence and standing up to challenges. Okay? Mishmuhim is up to We all do mistakes. The main thing is that you stand up, you excel, and you're conscious of what you're doing on all the different levels. Usually the tragic hero falls because he does not pay attention to one of the levels, either the cosmic or the, some of them stand at the political level, or uh, at the political level only. These tragic characters are in a sense larger than life. Larger than life, and they represent us in life, but what they are facing is bigger, is larger than we can imagine ourselves doing. Read about, when we read about Oedipus, uh, Tyrannos, Oedipus the king, uh, you will feel mixed feeling about him. But you feel as if you were, the, I was there in his shoes, uh, so to say. They also communicate intense and stubborn sentiments and they meet them with steadiness, self-sacrifice, and arrogance. So this is the tragic hero. Oedipus is a tragic hero at grips with his destiny, Moira. He's a good person. Elna could fall. Oedipus is a man who applies his powers of reason in order to solve a riddle, a riddle of life, and he fails. He ends up killing his father unknowingly and marrying his mother unknowingly and standing in front of his fate, of his Moira, in front of the chorus. By the way, when the play is taking place, we have a chorus. Chorus represent the voice of the people. Okay? All the uh, actors have masks. Okay? Horn up there, we have the Sphinx and Oedipus that we're going to read about. He sold the riddle of the Sphinx, this creature. Oedipus Rex is played in, till today. In, يعني, أنا, uh, I just love when, wherever I travel to go to the theater. If I travel to Egypt, to India, or to Europe, or to the States, or to Greece, okay? First thing I do, I spend two, three days, see if there's a play there, especially tragic plays, I just love them, okay? So this is a play. Usually, even in Greek culture, the actors put on masks to represent the characters, okay? So these are the masks. This is a modern play, Oedipus, when he blinded himself, okay, at the end of the play, when he, everything was known to him, okay? So here we have a performance of the grip of destiny or of Moira on these actors. Now I was talking about the chorus. The chorus represents the, one of the, represents the voice of the people. Manata, we're going to see an Oedipus Rex that we are reading, but it's four or five uh, 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 songs, let's call them, uh, of the uh, chorus. Uh, they sum up uh, the vision from outside. Not the vision of the actor. The actor is in a sense as if he, she is blinded. Uh, I'm sorry guys, huh? Uh, I didn't finish everything. Uh, I think this is online. Should you have any questions, you have my email on the handout. Just drop by or send me an email. Anyway, you're going to discuss in details during your lectures. Thank you and have a uh, fruitful and enjoyable semester.